a defensive wall, or bank around a castle, fort, or settlement. That is the definition of a rampart. The title of our brand new sermon series in which Pastor Terry will be starting. Today's message is entitled, Bulletproof Soul. Let's now join Terry in the sanctuary. Larry brought it up, and that is a Supreme Court ruling that came down. It says now it is, will be recognized in all 50 states, uh, a homosexual marriage. And so I'm sure that when people heard that, and especially the church, there was all kinds of reactions. There was anger. There was sadness. There was fear. There was confusion. There was even some rejoicing in many churches. And so... Uh, and you may be wondering, what's Foursquare's stance on this whole situation? Well, I just want to read to you what came down from Foursquare, and it says this. The following statement is the official stance, stance of Foursquare Church in this resolution passed by the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel Board of Directors. And it says this. Foursquare churches understand marriage to be a biblical covenant between a man and a woman. Therefore, Foursquare ministers are authorized to solemn, solemnize marriages only between a man and a woman. This reference is in Bylaw 14.4b under the pastor duties, which states, evangelism, evangelize the community, strive for salvation of souls, edify the church, and build up Christian life throughout the church by preaching, teaching, conducting services, and administering ordinances, including marriage only between a man and a woman. So this is something that they seem coming down. So what does this mean for the future? We don't know. The doors are open. And we know that the enemy, we, we understand. Listen, our fight is not against homosexuals. It's not. As vile or, or as mean spirit as they may be, we don't respond in the same way. My first response to it was like, I'm so angry. I'm so angry. I want to fight back. I'm being serious. I really did. I want to fight back. But it's amazing. Jesus, he was in a, a, a culture that was so against him. Christians, throughout all history, the culture was against them. There's a time when babies, baby, especially baby girls, were left out in the elements to die. And it was the Christians who came along against all culture and all popular opinion and all the rules of the land and came along and took those babies in and raised them. It was Christians who went into the plagues. When people had the plagues, everyone left them out to die. What did Christians do? They went out there. They went against what the culture was doing. They went against those things, and they loved on these people. And it was the Christian's reactions that's constantly winning people over, winning people over. Ronnie and I was talking about that this, this morning, and one of the things he said was um, there was a particular group. They all tweeted. They got on social media, and they said, hey, let's all meet this church. We're going to, uh, we're going to show them there's force with this. We're going to uh, disrupt their service. And there was a homosexual group that did that, and so they, they came in full force, and the church knew about it. And the church was prepared for them, and they loved on them. They loved on them. And when these people came in, everyone in the church loved on them and was gracious to them and kind to them and showed them what Jesus Christ was really like. They were expecting a fight. They really were. But what they got was the Holy Spirit. And they finally realized, we can't do anything here. <laughs> these people are just way too nice. And so it did not work. It backfired. You know, we have to be prepared. We have to be prepared. Things are going to change. It, uh, who knows? We do know that it's the floodgates open, and we know that there's a spiritual leading of all this it's not they're confused they're so confused they're lost they're broken as you and i once were until jesus came into our lives amen and so therefore we want to love on them we want to be what jesus called us to be we want to continue evangelizing we want to continue preaching we want to continue uh, doing the things that god has called us to do making disciples he didn't call us to all of a sudden start fighting against them amen so we will continue on in that stance. We'll continue on preaching what the Bible says. Hallelujah. The Bible does not change. And amen. 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 It does not change, and neither will we. We will continue to preach the word of God, the whole word of God, and we'll preach it in love. For us to neglect this area would be cruel. So we need to address this area. But to harp on it and beat on it all the time would be fruitless. So we want to do the right thing in Jesus' love. So I just want to let you know how we should respond in that situation. Well, in saying that, we are now in a brand new series that's called Rampart. And uh, I can't think of a better time for this series. God knows what he's doing. Can I tell you that? When I, when I heard the news, my heart sank. 
I, I, like I told you, my first reaction until, you know, you sit there, I'm one of those always guys who reacts wrong first, okay? <laughs> so I just, but then, but then I started thinking and started uh, doing some research, doing some reading, and then uh, going into the lesson that was prepared. Uh, this actually comes from Levi Lesko from the Fresh Life Church. He preached this series to their church, and it was so good. But we had the series picked out before we knew this was coming down, and I can't think of a better time for this series. First of all, let me get rid of my gum. What is a rampart? A rampart. It's like this huge wall around a building. It, it's a, well, there's a, yeah, there's a good example right there, like a castle type thing. But the whole purpose of a rampart is this. It's to keep out the bad. It's to protect everything that's inside. A rampart can be made of wood. It can be made of earth. It can be made of stone. It can be made of anything. But the whole purpose behind a rampart it's to protect all that was within. It's to protect the city, to protect the people, and to keep out that which is bad and push it back. Well, God has given his church a rampart. And that rampart that God has given the church is joy. We may think, joy, how in the world is that? How does that help me? See, when we look at a building like that or a stone like that, we think strong. When you picture joy, you think soft, cuddly. You know what I'm saying? Ah, frolicking through the field. You know, that's what we think. But joy that God has given the church is a very powerful thing. When a person has joy in their heart, uh, they're, in defense, they're undefeatable. I've got some things right here. When we have joy in our hearts, there's something about us that just, just causes, it's, it's a strength, it's a power. You're unbeatable. Nothing can overtake you. Why? Because that joy is what sustains you. See, the thing is this. Circumstances dictate how we feel lots of times. But joy, which the world did not give us, if it's the joy of the Lord. I'm not just talking about just flippant joy. I'm talking about the joy that comes from knowing God, the joy that comes from serving God, the joy that comes from loving God and God loving us. That holds us. The world didn't give it to us. So therefore, whatever happens around us, the world can't take it away. Amen? And that joy is there and it protects our hearts, it protects our minds and it keeps us and where God wants us to be. So we're not controlled by the winds. We're not controlled by everything out there. We're controlled by the love of God that's inside of our hearts and it gives us joy. And whatever the circumstance may be, praise God, we are safe, we are protected, we are preserved, amen? So that's what God wants to instill in his church today. Like I said, we look around us. We look at the government. By the way, government's not our salvation, amen? It's man. It's man. God is our salvation. And we look at this stuff, and we look at the world, and it's chaos, and it could be very disheartening, and it could rob you of your strength. It could rob you of your health. It could rob you of your sleep. That's the devil. It comes to still kill, rob, and destroy, amen? And so we need this joy. We need the rampart for our hearts. And what I want to talk about, we're going to go through the book of Philippians. No, the book of Philippians, what it is, it's a letter by Paul written to the people of Philippi. That's where we get the name Philippians. And it's just a letter. And in it, uh, what we find out is this letter was written by a guy who was in prison. I want you to hear this. When you read Philippians, and it's only four chapters long, out of it exudes triumph. Out of it exudes uh, victory. It really does. You read that thing, man, this, there's a lot of great nuggets. Matter of fact, a lot of the things that we say, uh, we, we tweet or we, little nuggets, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength and just goes on and on and on. These things are within Philippians. And it comes from a guy who, was, who wrote this. But where was this guy? He was in prison. He was on death row. He was going to die. And yet, when we read this, we don't read it. You would never know that. Why? Because this guy, something was, the circumstances weren't controlling how he talked. Circumstances didn't control how he wrote to the church. So what was it? It was the joy of the Lord that was in his heart. Joy of the Lord was his strength. The joy makes us unstoppable and makes us indestructible. That's what joy does to our hearts, and we need that. The church needs that, especially in the world and the season in which we live today. Listen to this. When joy surrounds your heart, write this down. When joy surrounds your heart, it doesn't matter what else surrounds you. When joy surrounds your heart, it doesn't matter what else surrounds you. There could be tons of different things that surround your heart. 
things at home, things in relationships, things in the job, things in the world. But when joy is around our heart, it doesn't matter what those things are. You guys remember last week, I think it was, I talked about the story of Elisha. Remember, he, his, his servant woke up early one morning and he looked outside and around the whole city was a, uh, this particular king. Uh, he had circled the whole city just to capture Elisha with his entire army out there. And hit this guy, he, he's getting up, you know, he's making his orange juice and all of a sudden he sees all this stuff and he drops his orange juice and he goes into Elijah, 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 they got us trapped, what are we gonna do? Elijah remained calm. Why? How could he do that? Because he knew that it wasn't just them that was around them, but God was also around him. And so Elisha prayed, Lord, open the eyes of my servant that he can see. And when he opened his eyes, what did he see? He saw the mountains full of chariots of fire of God's people right there, and God's army. So it didn't matter about this little king's army. God's army was there. Amen? So that's why we have to, we want the joy of the Lord in our hearts. It doesn't matter what surrounds us. As long as we have the joy around our heart, we are protected. It's a rampart. Let's open up in Philippians 1. We're going to read just the first two verses in chapter 1. But I just want to kind of describe it along the way. First of all, it says this. Paul and Timothy, that's who this letter is from. See, back then, they didn't wait to the very end to say who the letter was from. They, they did it right at the very beginning because it was written in scrolls. So you had to unroll it all the way to get the very end to see if it was junk mail or not. But this one, he lets you know right up front, hey, this is from Paul and this is from Timothy. And we just want to let you know. So they see this as Paul and Timothy. Remember, uh, he's in jail and Timothy is probably writing this for him. He's in chains. It says, bond servants of Jesus Christ. Bond servants. You know, another word for that is slave. You know, that, what is a bond servant? That's someone who says, I will be your slave for this season. I will be your slave for this many years, number of years. Well, Paul is talking to the people of uh, 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 Philippi, and he says, we are bond servants. We have made ourselves slaves to God. Listen, there's a lot of people today who say, I don't want to be a slave. You are already a slave. Because when we sin, the Bible says, you are a slave to sin. So we're either a slave to sin, or we are a slave to what God wants to do in our lives. Amen? So when, listen, when you're a slave to God, you are a king. You are a ruler. When you're a slave to this world, you're underneath the world's feet. Hallelujah. Amen? Are we out there, church? <laughs> say, hi Terry. hi, Terry. Praise God. All right. I should have had you say praise God. But listen. They were servants of God. They're slaves of God. We should be slaves of God. We should say, yes, I want to be a slave of God. And that makes us rulers, not just slaves. Hallelujah. So, so who is this? Who, who is he writing to? We know who it is. It's Paul and Timothy writing and uh, what, who he is. And then also, who is he writing to? And he says this, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So this letter is written to all the Christians in that church in Philippi. See, a, a long time ago before this, before this, it's like 10 years ago, Paul was here and he helped start the church. He did something great I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But now 10 years later, there's a church there. It's thriving. And so Paul's writing a letter to them. And he's writing it to all the saints in the church. Not only the saints in the church, the Christians, but he's also writing it to the bishops and the deacons. Bishops is another name for a preacher or a teacher. And the deacons are those are the leaders within the church body. So he's writing it to the leaders. I want you to listen to this. He's writing to the preacher and he's writing it to every single one else in the, out there listening. He says, listen, I have something for you. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, quick. I, I just want to quick give you a quick background about this place, Philippi. It's, it's a mining town. What it was, I don't know its first name. There was a first name it had, but it's a mining town. They found gold in the mountains around it. Then there's gold in them, there are hills. And so what happens when you find gold? You have to build up a town or a city to support all the things that's happening there. And that's how Philippi got started. And so here we are. It's a mining town. And it's growing with all the things that's happening there. And, uh, and the, there's, lots, you know, there's lots of great things that we could pull from Philippians. Like I said, a lot of great nuggets. But one of the nuggets that Paul wants to write when he wrote to the Philippians, and I think that's how you call it, when he wrote to the people of the church of Philippi, when he wrote to them, he wanted them to give them a certain nugget, and he wanted to give them this nugget. He says, he talked about joy. He talked about joy again and again in all four of these chapters. Matter of fact, he mentions joy 18 times within these four. Why? Because he knew that as a good teacher, you had to repeat things again and again and again so students could get, it, could get it. A good teacher always repeated again and again. Let me repeat that. A good teacher repeats things again and again and again. 
And so that's what he was doing right here. So he's saying, look, I want you to know something. I'm talking about joy. I'm talking about joy. Get this in your heart. Joy is going to be your rampart. Joy is going to be your strength, the joy of knowing the Lord, not just joy and happiness out here, the joy of knowing the Lord and serving God. That is what I want to do for you. So Paul is writing to them. They're hearing this, and the message he really wants to get across is joy. And there's something else he wants them to understand. And I'm going to put this up on here. What happens to you doesn't have to control you. People in Philippi, you're surrounded by Romans. It's a Roman colony. And uh, what, what's happening here, you don't have to. Uh, they're anti-God. They're anti-Christianity. They're anti-Jews. They, they're very proud of their own culture. But here we are. He says, look, you don't have to be controlled by the things that happen around you. What happens to you does not have to control you. Let's just stop and ponder that real quick. What happens to you doesn't have to control you. There's a lot of victim mentality that goes on even within the church. But he's saying, look, don't let the circumstances control your life. There's something deeper. There's something greater. If you would just dig and go after God, you're going to find something that's even more powerful than the circumstances around you that's going to set you free. I know some people within the church, they'll come to me, and it's not here, but no one here right now, but they would come to me, and every single time they see me, it's like, oh, there's Terry. Uh, this is happening to me. This is happening to me. My life stinks, and blah, 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 all over me. Every single Sunday morning. Yeah. <laughs> Until one day, I finally stopped this person right in their tracks. I said, do you, have not any, do you not have anything good to say? Has God not done anything good in your life this week? They just stared at me. I walked away. <laughs> I'm serious. There's just some people, they let the circumstances and they think that's the only thing I have to talk about, so I'm going to talk about all the bad things around me. And their whole world is wrapped up about the things around them. What happens to you doesn't have to control you, amen? And that's the whole thing that God says. Look, what happens around you doesn't have to control you. I want to give you something that's in you that's more powerful than the world that's outside of you, amen? And when you lean upon this thing, you trust in this thing, you're going to have victory in your life. You're going to be different from this person who constantly goes Bleh, all over Pastor Terry every Sunday morning. You're going to be different. That's what God wants in our lives. Listen, the world is full of people throwing up on each other. They do it. All. Yeah, it is. Get on Facebook. Get on Twitter. Get on all these things. Get on the social. Get, just listen to them. They're all throwing up on each other. It is uh, it's a mess out there, okay? But the church should be different. The church has something that they don't have. And that's the joy of knowing God. And we need to live like it. We need to talk like it. We need to act like it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of knowing God. The joy of serving God. It's awesome. And they should look at you saying, you're weird. Say, hallelujah. It's the joy of the Lord. You can have it too. Amen? Amen. I'm off track here. Paul knew that the church knew all about his conditions. When Paul was writing this letter, remember, he's on death row. And Paul knew that the church of Philippi at this time, they knew that he was in prison. They knew that he was in chains for the God and for gospel. And they knew that he knew he was going to die. But when he wrote them letters, did he let his circumstances dictate what he wrote? No. See, Paul, if anybody, had a right to say, my life is bad. Paul could say, my life was bad. <laughs> we could all say that. But the thing was this, he didn't do that. He didn't let the circumstances around him dictate what his, came out of his mouth, what came out of his heart, what came out of his relationships. Hallelujah, he pulled for something a whole lot different from that. Paul had every right to complain. Paul had every right to be in a bad mood. Paul had every right to grumble. A lot of us think, I've got a right to grumble. You don't know what happened to me. I have a right, I have a right to be miserable. And don't you dare make me happy. That's, you see, the world is like that. It may be exaggerated there, but that's exactly how they act. That's exactly how some Christians act. I have a right to be upset. I have a right to be miserable for the next three months. I have a right to this ulcer. It's mine because of all the bad things that happened to me. What happens to you doesn't have to control you is what Philippians is telling us. Amen? It doesn't have to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul wanted them to know, you can take my life, you can kill me, but you can't take my joy because you didn't give it to me. Hallelujah. What happens to you doesn't have to control you. you. You always have a choice. 
Things can go bad, but you can still be good. Amen? Things can go bad, and guess what? They will go bad, <laughs> but you still can be good. That is the power of joy. There's a, a great scripture that speaks of this, and this is uh, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Yeah, anyway, it's one of those Jewish words, <laughs> names. <laughs> and this, it's in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 17 through 18. Listen to this. This is how our lives and this is how our voice should be. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crops fail and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Did you check that out? See all those even those? And I don't think I even got them all underlined. In between there, it doesn't matter what happens to us. In between the even those and I will, it doesn't matter what happens to us. We have a choice because we have God's spirit inside of us to do I will. Even though all these bad things happen to me, I choose to worship. I choose to rejoice in these things because my joy doesn't come from these even those. Amen? Look at this. this if you're in agriculture, if you're a farmer, farmers, does this look pretty bad? Yes, that looks pretty bad. <laughs> even though the, the, the fruits, the fruit trees have no fruit on them. There's, there's their income. Even though there's no blossoms, there's no grapes on the vine, there's no olive crop and it fails. And all your fields, you plant seeds and nothing's growing. Your, seed, your fields are, your plans are ruined. The things that you dreamed, the things that you worked for, even though you didn't, got nothing from it, I will. I will rejoice in God. I will choose to rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. That is a Christian's life. And Paul's saying, church, with the spirit of God inside of us, and we rely upon him and his word, we have a choice. We don't have to be like the world. See, they stay, they don't have an even though. And, they, and their will is, I will let the circumstances control me. Church, we don't have to let the circumstances control us. Things will be bad just like this, but we can choose to worship God. Amen? Amen. Say, even though, even though I, will. I will, even though, even though I, will. I will, hallelujah, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will praise the God of my salvation. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter. We need to tap into something. We need to tap into something deeper. We need to tap into that. See, those who are controlled by their circumstances don't tap into what's in here. They only let the things out here control them. We have something deeper. Hallelujah. It's God. Hallelujah. Our joy doesn't depend on circumstances. See, circumstances didn't give us our joy, so therefore circumstances can't take them away. Amen? If all of, listen, if all your joy is wrapped up in your circumstances and what you, all your plans, then you got your uh, hopes in something that's wrong because it, this world will fail you. Your spouses will fail you. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying, I'm just saying we fail each other. Parents will fail us. Children will fail us. Governments will fail us. These things will fail us. But when we put our hope in God, he does not fail. Hallelujah. He does not fail. He is our God. He's our joy and he's our strength. So we need to dig into something deeper in that. What happens to you doesn't have to control you. God wants to set you free from victim thinking. <clears throat> we live in a society today that says being a victim is a good thing. We do, don't we? We live in a society today that says, being uh, these things that happen to you, you have a right and you should sue. I, I forget who it was. Uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, that guy, uh, his daughter, he tripped on a, I'm getting political here. So anyway, <laughs> she tripped on a crack on a sidewalk and she wanted to sue for five millions. I mean, come on, this is the world that we are, we are propagating, the, 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 the media is. That's not where our joy comes from. Not in our circumstances, but it comes from knowing God. Amen? Yes. All right, let's go back 10 years before Paul was in prison. Let's go back. Paul's in prison right now, and he's writing to the Philippians. But now let's go back 10 years when he very first came to Philippi. But first, Paul wanted to do, he wanted to go to Asia. He felt God calling him, go to Asia and preach. Go to Asia and preach to the Asians. And so he tried again and again, and God shut him down. The Bible says that the Spirit would not let him go any further. And he just, and things weren't happening. Things were doing miserable. And so Paul's like, man, it's not working here. Until one night, God gave Paul a dream, and then it was a man from Macedonia, Macedonia I think it was, uh, Macedonia, he, uh, from Europe area, in Europe, and he says, come over here, Paul, come over here. And so Paul woke up, and he says, you know what, 
God's spirit spoke to me in a dream and he's called me to go to Europe. I have this desire for, to preach to Asians, uh, people of Asia, but God has called me to Europe over here. So Paul goes over there and he takes uh, Silas with him. So they get on this boat and they travel uh, however far it was and, uh, and they get there and they get off the boat and now here they are at Philippi, this, this mining town. But the very first time, Paul goes there. And as he's there, as Paul's custom is, he would always go to the synagogue. Why? Because he would go there and he would listen to him uh, read the Psalms, read the, the, the law, and then they would talk. And then and he would stand up and preach. And so he goes. But the thing is, there is no uh, synagogue in Philippi. Why? Because uh, Jews, they, they would, if they couldn't go to the temple, they would build a synagogue to, uh, to worship together. But you had to have at least 10 men to build a synagogue, 10 Jews. And so this tells us right now, there's, there's hardly any Jews in Philippi. So what, what they normally do, they usually go and worship and sing songs and read scriptures around a body of water. So Paul goes to this uh, riverbank. Let's uh, go ahead and read it right here in Acts 16, 13. It says this, and on the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from uh, Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth. This woman was wealthy. This woman was rich. Uh, uh, A merchant who worshiped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized. What do we see here? Paul steps foot on Europe. And this is his very first convert, a lady named Lydia. And if you find out where Lydia actually came from, she actually was from Asia. And uh, yeah, she was from Asia. And God says, you know what? I don't want you to go to Asia. I want you to go over here because I have a woman from Asia over there that I want, you, I want to use to bring the gospel throughout the whole region there. Region there. So Paul, he, he goes there and he, he doesn't know anything about her, but he, he preaches and her heart is changed, is challenged, and she gets excited for the things of God. And so she is saved, and she goes and gets her whole family, and they're all saved. She gets her whole household. This woman's an evangelist already. And here's Paul. And this is his very first convert there. So praise God. We have a woman who's very wealthy, doing very well, has great things, has purple. Uh, you've heard of pink Cadillac. She had a purple Cadillac. This woman had it all. She was rich. But you know what? There's something inside of her that was longing for something more. And here comes Paul with the gospel of Jesus Christ. She receives it with gladness and joy, and now her whole household is saved. Praise God. She trusts God for that. And guess what happens? The devil shows up. <laughs> hey, something great could be happening. You plan something good for God. Guess who's going to show up? The devil. He always shows up when God is doing something. When, at the beginnings of something great and something big, the devil always shows up. See, when you, in your own life, you're thinking, you know what? I want to start tithing. The devil's going to show up and affect your finances. When you're out there saying, you know, I'm going to read the Bible through this year, and I'm going to study, I'm going to be in prayer every day, the devil's going to cause things to happen so that you can't do it. Every single time you start to do something small to grow with God, the devil will always show up. I'm going to work at the church. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to teach. I'm going to do this and that. Excuses, excuses will pop up, and that's where the devil comes. And the devil showed up at this one time. Paul was there. This is found in Acts 16, 16 through 18. It says this. One day as we were going down to the place. Oh, I'm sorry. I... I should have, I went to the wrong place. Did I? Oh, no, I was in the right one. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit, she was demon-possessed, that enabled her to tell the future. Listen, the devil can do miracles. The devil could do things that we can't do. People, I, I don't like that, Pastor Terry. Well, it's a spiritual thing, and they can do some powerful things that we can't understand. But our God is greater. Amen. When we have the Spirit of God inside of us, we never need to fear the power of the devil. It is null and void in your life when you have the Spirit of God in your life. Amen? He can mess with you. He can make things miserable around you. And that's what he will do. He will affect your family. He'll affect those around you and your job. But you know what? Jesus is victorious in our life and in our lives. And so we don't have to worry about the power of the devil. There's those who make pacts with the devil say, you know what? If if you give me power, if you give me this ability to, to... tell futures, if you give me this ability to read minds, whatever it may be, you know, I will serve you. And the devil does that with some people. The devil does do that with some people. But you know what? They're always slave to that, always a slave. And if they're not dead right now, if, they're, if they've served the devil and they're dead, they're in hell right now. 
or they're on their way to hell because the devil has controlled their minds, has controlled their emotions, has controlled their lives. But our God is greater. So anyway, here we have a woman, a girl, who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She could do it. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Now, I don't know if she was mocking. I don't know, if, whatever it was, but either way, she was interruptive. The devil loves to interrupt things. He loves to come in and cause confusion and cause division in our lives, and he will. He'll do, it, he'll do his best to do it to this church. And so we need to be aware of that, and we need to be prepared for that. But here it was, this woman just walking around, demon-possessed, and this demon inside her is causing her to shout these things. And whether it was mocking or what, Paul got tired of it, you know, just, just again and again, interrupting, interrupting, mocking, going on and on. So when you start something good, Satan will always oppose you. That's something I want you to always remember. Look at Paul's reaction when the devil showed up. <laughs> this went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon. See, this is the only time. Most of the times when people go into the places, they're in there with love and they're doing great things and, and they're doing mighty things for God and things are happening. But this is something that happened when Paul got angry. <laughs> Paul got exasperated and he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And instantly I left her. Yeah, I, I believe he said it with power and authority. Amen? I mean, you don't command somebody, I command you to come out. You don't command. That, that doesn't command authority, does it? Sometimes we have to do that. You know, I love what Smith Wigglesworth says. When, when you talk to the devil, you have to do it like you talk to a little dog that keeps following you. Get out of here. Leave. You don't say, go home, go home, go home. You don't do that. So that's how we need to talk to the devil. That's how we need to pray sometimes. I got to talk to the devil? No, you, you tell him. You tell him to get out. Amen? Because of the Spirit of God. So anyway, he does that. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And instantly, it left her. Instantly. This woman was instantly changed. Everyone knew it. Everyone knew it. And as a result of this, what happens? All these men who are making money off of her, all these men who are abusing her, the men who are using her, you know, they lost their money, and that made them angry. And so... They came after Paul. They grabbed Paul. They grabbed Silas. They took him, and they took some rods and sticks, and they got a mob. They're always good at getting mobs in the Bible. That's just so weird. And, and so they got this mob going, and they took these sticks, and they, the Bible says they severely beat them, severely. They were bleeding, stripped them of their clothes, severely beat them with these things. And then they took them to the uh, jailer and says, put them in jail. And so he put them in the inner dungeon part, the innermost dungeon, and, and, and put them in stocks. And, and what they do with stocks, they would spread your legs as wide as you can. They put these stocks on you. And can you imagine the cramping up that would happen if you was like that all night long. And then they would put their hands in chains as well. These guys were like this all night long with their backs bleeding and throbbing and in pain all night long. Man, did they have a right to be upset? <laughs> did they have a right to mope and cry and complain? Amen? They did. <laughs> they did. But what happens instead? Look at verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They were having church. <laughs> at midnight, Paul and Silas were having church right after they were beaten and they're in stocks. And they were singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. They weren't quiet about it. They were rejoicing in God. What did they do? They said, even though I will, even though I'm bleeding, I'm hurting, I'm in pain, I'm in misery, and I hate this. It's wrong. I was doing things good for God, and all of a sudden the devil showed up. Now look at me. Even though I will worship God. Amen? That's their choice. Church, this is our choice. That was their choice. And when they worship God, when you worship God, that is a weapon. That is a weapon in your hands where there's darkness over here and it's just raining and it's just pouring down and just, your life is miserable. When you go in and worshiping God, all of a sudden the light and the love of God fills that place and the devil leaves. Amen? The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Even though I will. That's what Paul and, Paul and Silas did. Even though I will. And so now they're worshiping God. And what happens? God shows up into that church service in a mighty way. He shows up with an earthquake, so powerful that the, the shackles on the, the, the doors all swing open, not just to their prison cell, but to all the prison cells. They're just wide open, wham! Not only that, the shackles break apart. Even the chains off their hands, that is some major shaking going on right there. You know what? Shake, and then God just does these things and sets them free. And the jailer 
awakened by that thing. He was probably awakened by their singing. <laughs> He's probably going, what is going on down there? But anyway, all of a sudden, an earthquake happens. God shows up in my way. Earth, uh, the jailer goes down there, and he's looking for him, can't, sees all the doors open. Instantly, he thought, I don't, I'm going to, they're going to kill me for what happens. My only job is to make sure that they stay here. <laughs> and now they're gone. So he pulls his sword, ready to take his life. And what does Paul do? Stop, stop, don't take your life. You know, most Christians would say, you jerk, you deserve this for what you did to my back. You know what I'm saying? We wouldn't show the love of God. We wouldn't show the joy. We would show our circumstances as I hate this and, and you're the cause of all this. But no, they said stop. And what happens? He calls for light and he sees them and he bows down at their feet. He gets on his knees and says, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And they tell him, accept Jesus Christ into your life. Hallelujah. Live for him. He'll fill you. He'll fill you with his spirit, and you will be saved. So he pulls them out, and the man who put the beating on him, and now he's washing their wounds. Now he's, he's healing their wounds. Praise God. And not only does he get saved and baptized, but so does his whole family. Look at that. Look at these good things that happen. Number one, Paul and Silas, they show up. We have Lydia, a rich woman who was seeking these things and didn't find her peace in it, but she found her peace and joy in the Lord, Jesus Christ. She's happy. Uh, we have the slave girl who's being abused and being used and wants to be free. She's set free. She's delivered. She's happy. Paul and Silas, they're rid of her, <laughs> chasing her around. They're happy. We have a jailer now. He's not going to have to die, have to kill himself. He's happy. He's saved as well. Do you see what's all happening? Why is all this happening? Because the joy of the Lord was Paul and Silas' strength, not their, the things that happened to him, not their circumstances. Praise God. And all those things... They chose to let the joy of the Lord be their strength. They chose to let God be their victory. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. Church, we have the same choice. We have not been beaten. We've not been jailed yet. We've not been really persecuted. There is persecution happening now in America. It is happening. Is it not? We see the signs. We better be prepared. What's going to be our rampart? Our circumstances? Nah. Or the joy of the Lord. Amen? The joy of the Lord. Say it with me. The joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where was I? What happens to you does not have to control you. Families are slave, saved. Hallelujah. Jimmy, if you come up and play some music for us. Now I want to draw your attention back to verse 2. Now, that was the history. Now let's, let's come back up to when Paul was writing to the uh, Phil, uh, Philippi, the people, the church of Philippi. The, I guess you can call them Philippians, can you? <laughs> okay. All right, the Philippians. And so, uh, verse 2. First of all, he, he has a greeting. He says, hey, it's Paul and, si and Timothy. We're writing this letter, and, uh, and we're servants of God. We're slaves of God. Hallelujah. We're not slaves to this world. We're not slaves to sin. We're slaves to God. And so what happens? Now, here they are. And at the end of this, at the, this is still the verse two, first two verses. Now he gives a blessing to the church there. He gives them a blessing, and here's the blessing he gives. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at the writings of Paul, he does this a lot. He always has grace and peace be unto you. You see that a lot, and he always puts them together. It just seems that these two words always go hand in hand. Always you see them together when Paul writes. But not only that, it's always in this order. It's always grace, and then it's peace. It's never the other way around. Why is that? Because you can't have peace until you've had the grace of God in your life. You can't have peace of God until you have his grace and his forgiveness in your life. See, the world is looking for peace. We're looking for peace in the Middle East. We're looking for peace uh, in the United States. We're looking for peace all over the place. But the peace, they'll never find that peace. I mean, there's going to come a time when Jesus Christ comes back. And when he comes back, he's going to come back as a mighty warrior. He's going to come back. He's, he's going to rescue his people. But there's going to be a time he's going to come back and he's going to rule on this earth as its rightful king. Amen? And we're going to be his subjects. We're going to rule with him. Hallelujah. Because we've endured and we've put our faith and trust and hope in Jesus Christ. And we have the joy of the Lord. And so we're going to rule with him. But God, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule. And every knee is going to bow. 
And every tongue is going to confess that he is God. Amen? So, that's when we'll have peace in the world. You know, the whole world groans. Did you know that? The Bible says that all creation groans. It's waiting for Jesus to come back. It's waiting for peace. It's waiting for peace to happen on this earth. The earth is groaning. Why? Because there's sin in the world and it's broken. And it's still part of that. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to rule and there's going to be peace and the earth's going to have it and we're going to have it. But right now, Paul is writing to us and he says, grace and peace be to you. And the only way that you can have peace is if you accept the grace of and forgiveness of God. See, grace is unmerited favor. We don't deserve salvation. We don't. I don't care how nice you are. <laughs> I really don't. But uh, that doesn't save you. My, my charm, <laughs> good looks, it won't save me. It won't do anything for me, actually. <laughs> but it won't save you. It's only the grace and the love of God See, Jesus says, God says, I give you grace. He says, I'm going to give you Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you my son. I'm going to give you something. You deserve others, but I'm going to give you my son. I'm going to watch him die on the cross. But it's the only way that you can receive salvation is through what Jesus is going to do for you. It's through his blood. And if you receive the grace that I, I so freely offer you, it's yours. Please take it. That's what he's saying to the world. Please take this grace. And when you accept the grace of God, then the peace of God will come in and guard your heart. Amen? The peace and the joy of God will come in and it will guard your heart when you accept the grace of God. So Paul is saying, grace and peace be unto you. Church, we need to know that and we need to be about going about that when we tell people. Hallelujah. This peace is not just an absence of war. It's a wholeness. It's everything that God wants in our lives. On the inside, we all want peace. Lydia wanted it. The slave girl wanted it. The jailer longed for it. We long for it as well. But we're all looking. We're all looking. You can't have peace until you get the grace God wants to give you. Can I just say it again? We can't have peace until we have the grace of God. And we know that as a church today, those who are saved. Hallelujah. Peace is the outcome of salvation, and grace is the means of salvation. Grace is how we get saved. That's how we get saved. Peace is what happens once you're saved. Grace is the unmerited favor of God and God's riches for us. In a world that seems to be so broken and wrong, we need the peace of God. Amen? Amen. Church, we need that. We need to make it our rampart. We need to make the joy of the Lord our rampart. And we can only have that when we ask Jesus into our lives. Would you please bow your heads and I want you to pray. Hallelujah, Lord God. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your joy that you give us, Lord God. It doesn't depend upon the circumstances around us. The world could be against us. The world could persecute and kill us, Lord God. It could take away everything that we have, including our clothes and our family. But God, there's something that's greater that protects our heart, and we're just so grateful, Lord God. It's not the things of this world. It's the joy of knowing you as our Lord and Savior. It's the joy of receiving your grace in our lives. It's the joy that comes because of the peace that you've given us with you. It's the joy that the world has not given and the world can't take it away. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And Lord God, I pray that our lives would reflect that. Our attitudes would reflect that. Amen, church? Pray that. Pray, God, may my attitude reflect the joy that's within me. Forgive me for having the victim mentality. I am mighty through Christ Jesus. I am victorious through the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. I have a joy that the world did not give me, and it can't take it away. And I choose, even though I will worship my God, even though these things happen, I will love my Lord God. I will seek Him, even though I will worship Him and have victory in the areas of my life. Hallelujah. Even though, bring it on, world, even though I will serve God, and the joy of the Lord will be my strength. And Lord God, as, as, as your joy is our rampart, the world will see a difference in us. They will. It will be night and day as it was with Paul and Silas. And people around us will be saved and set free. Amen? Hallelujah. God didn't just give it to us so we can flaunt it to the world. God gave it to us so we could be a pattern unto the world. And the world can see it and long for that in their lives as well. The world today, through the homosexual agenda, there are people out there who are struggling with their own self-identity. 
and they're demanding that we think of them as normal as as way God as all creation that God created and they know in their heart that it's not but yet they fight and fight and fight our battle's not against them they're looking for some people who know and have joy in their lives and they could see that and they long for it and we would lovingly share it with them amen we can't share it with them if there's not joy there we can't share it with them if it's anger and retaliation and hatred we can only share it with the joy and the love of God is in our hearts. Hallelujah. So, Lord God, bless your church today. Thank you, Lord, for the joy. Lord, we choose, we will worship you. We choose to operate in the joy of the Lord in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. If you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ after listening to this message, or if you have any questions concerning our ministry here at Faith Outreach Center, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us through our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or you can call us at 574-223-7631 We would be happy to assist you in any way we can. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless.